I quite like comics writer Grant Morrison, and I felt as though it would be nice to introduce others to his work who are not familiar with him via this very entertaining 2010 documentary about the man himself. Morrison has a fascinating disposition on life, and his, where some, I think nowadays, have questioned his countercultural credibility due to writing some enormous titles for DC Comics, spearheading the big retcon revolution, which occurred, I think, in, well, there's the 2006 one, and then there's also the 2011 one, but I believe he was more involved in the 2006 Flashpoint in, um, saga. But I think the New 52 as well in 2011. Anyway, although also very acclaimed for a 1990s comic book series known as The Invisibles, 2000s work such as We Free, and some more recent work, which I've not explored yet, but I'd love to, which... Alec Moore's been um, composing these Lovecraft-inspired tales or ad slash adaptations, and Morrison, always in this kind of telepathic cosmic war with Moore, ha has decided that he's going to compose these stories which are inspired by the other weird fiction pioneers other than Lovecraft, who's the most well-known of these people, obviously. I was first introduced to Morrison via this very bizarre, uncouth take on the X-Men, uh, most well known now for, well, in retrospect, where people don't think of it, the redesign and the, the recreation of Emma Frost, which has been a very iconic aspect of the X-Men comic book series in the 2000s and to some degree beyond, perhaps. Joss Whedon's run I consider vastly inferior, and that's often praised for the Emma Frost character, but that's Morrison's character. Morrison, he didn't come up with Emma Frost, but that... that reimagining of the character in the early 2000s but Morrison's X-Men is actually most well known for the bizarre Zorn Magneto twist which some people assumed at the time was something that Morrison had decided at the last minute as some sort of spontane spontaneous Dadaist uh, you know subversive act although really it's it has been clarified in hindsight that Morrison intended this from the start Although it's it's a very elaborate and difficult to read the series with that in mind because well one we don't think of Magneto as that kind of character, not the well insofar as he's he's this secret agent of, of, of discord within the X Men like you'd think that's something like someone like Mystique would do but it's it's Magneto it's it's just weird, and then the people had problems of how genocidal Magneto was at the end of. The Morrison run, although I do seem to recall that in the nineties, this like the Eve of Destruction and um, in the, in the final arc of of the Lobdell era, he you know crucifies Dazzler, thinking it's Xavier, and he, he's very genocidal in that one too. It has a very similar ending to the Morrison run with with Wolverine you know, hacking him to death. Anyway, I like that run overall and the introduction of Phantom X. I mean, that's any character that homages those sort of diabolic criminal uh, characters so so coolly is, is a plus in my book, Phantom Ass. Um, obviously, Phantom Ass is older than those 60s characters, though he's, he belonged to that wave as well due to a series of, I guess, inaccurate to the original source material films but very popular films. Anyway, the true gem, I think, my favourite work in the Grant Morrison oeuvre, Zenith. Zenith is, along with Hellboy, Wolverine, and maybe a couple of, you know, Wild Dr. Manhattan, and uh, I've, I've always had a soft spot for Spawn... Yeah, I, I want to put Zenith in my top five superheroes, or maybe I would swap Zenith for Peter St. John, Mandala. Zenith was like Watchmen, except it wanted to be ever more... Um, Morrison perceived Watchmen as a bit of a... He, he's, there's this great quote where he describes... He, he's a bit very fond of Watchmen, as well as of Frank Miller's Dark Knight Returns, but he thought they were a bit bit concept album for him as a young man who grew up amongst this punk generation. And so he wanted each issue, each strip of Xenoph within the wider issue of 2000 AD to feel like 
like a Stock Aitken Waterman single. What Morrison wanted was something which is very... He, he admired Brendan McCarthy of, of 2000 AD and some other mags such as, I believe, Warrior more so, who'd created a very similar superhero character title to Paradox to the point where I think Brendan McCarthy was a bit annoyed at the, the unveiling of Zenith itself. Uh, but McCarthy's actually designed the characters of Zenith itself. The art by Steve Yowell is superlative. Though Morrison's story, it's taking the, the, the more metaphors of Watchmen even further wherein we have the, the, the World War, you know, this fascination in Britain with the clash of the generations, you know, the, the, the conflict between the greatest generation of the Second World War, the baby boomers of the 60s, and then the punk generation and, and you know, obsessed with dance music and, and gigs in the 80s, the Gen X. There was this fascinating parallel of metaphors utilising superhero characters. And I think you wonder how much of it is stream of consciousness and how much of it is very elaborate or whether Morrison believes his stream of consciousness will get him to something very elaborate <clears throat> within the implications of. But there's also an appeal to the mythological processes of Michael Moorcock, especially within the later, the latter two volumes of Zenith, wherein we encounter multiple different versions of the universe, including one where Britain's Maximan survives. If you've, you only know about those references if you've read Zenith. I've, I've been waffling on for too long now. See this as my endorsement of Grant Morrison's Zenith, as well as this very fine documentary from 2010.